Hello and welcome back to part two. Well, we've got the thermostat in and you know by now that M8 bolts into aluminium will be about 25 newton meters, okay? So that's talked up. The next thing we want to do is get to that bung plug. That's this one here, which has a plastic thread on it. It also has an O-ring on the top. Now these are quite prone to get damaged. Sockets 20 mil or 21 mil. And if you're going to use the original, replace the O-ring. This will stop it from leaking. Right, so the part number for this is BR3485, which is a bearmark number. It would be advisable to make sure you have one of these when you order a radiator or if you're doing anything on your cooling system. And there's a possibility that the threads could strip in the housing, so you have to be aware of this as well. Okay, so we're going to go and fit the radiator now. This is a brand new one. We have two pegs on the bottom side here which correspond to rubber grommets in the frame. Okay, make sure they're there and they're in good condition because these will stop vibration and it will prolong the life of the radiator because vibrations can cause damage over a long period of time. Anyway, slipping the radiator in it's just a matter of locating it on the pegs and making sure that the frame doesn't grab it on the left hand side edge right so I've got that in that's quite easy and it's all in place the frame is in its grommets and the radiator is in its grommets as well pegs on top of the radiator as I said in the last tutorial they also have rubber grommets on them so you can put this into place and then bolt it down Okay, you have some M8 bolts. Make sure that they are not long bolts. They should be the same length as the ones that were fitted, which is about 25 mil. Not rocket science to refit the brackets, but what I will say on these brackets, make sure that you position the radiator frame so it's not vibrating on the slam panel. Now you can see that that's free to move and it will vibrate. We've used a progressive frame rate so you can see the actual movement, the vibration of where it's going to, you can see that. Now that would rattle if it was touching. With the pipe hoses you want to have them as close to the pipe size as possible. That's the only advice I can give you on that. And sometimes cramming down a pipe hose will not stop a leak. So we've noticed this before and we've gone for these two hoses, ESR3121, that's the bottom hose and ESR2298 which is the top hose. The bottom hose also has the heater um, connection to it and this can be a bit awkward to remove. What you've got to remember is that the bracket that where my hands are just don't break it whatever you do you need that to clip the hose back in so keep that in mind when you're removing it easy to replace. I would strongly advise if you've got the 300 TDI and you have this bleed, air bleed system, replace it. Part number's here. The reason I say this is that with the pipes you also have a plastic block which is a valve. If the system has had gunge in it then there's a possibility that it won't bleed up as well as it should do. So I'd advise changing it. Okay, so you can see where it goes very clearly. O-rings for the oil feed pipes to the radiator also need to be changed. Part numbers on the screen, make sure you do that. You can order that when you get your radiator. And the last thing that I'm going to tell you about is the top hose. Make sure you don't fit it completely until you've got your cowling back on your radiator radiator frame. Remember the clips I showed you in episode 1? Well, there's a pipe underneath there and the pipe needs to be clipped back into place. This will stop it chafing when the vehicle's running. The cowling goes into two slots at the bottom of the frame and then bolted into place. You're big enough to know how to put Jubilee clips in and screw them up, so I'm not going to tell you about this. However, it's worthwhile going around and checking that you've done all your Jubilee clips up on all the pipes that you fitted and make sure that any bung plugs, like this one, has been put into place and tightened back up. That means that you can then go ahead and put fluid in it. The cylinder block drain plug also has a copper washer. Make sure that that's changed as well. The thermo viscous hub, that screws on anti-clockwise as it has a left hand thread. And it only needs to be nipped up, don't do it too tight. Now, I was talking about these bung plugs here. Okay, 
part numbers on the screen again for you. You also have a bung plug in the radiator, which is very helpful for bleeding up and filling. Remember that has a copper washer on that one. Right, so we have two bung plugs and we're going to leave them out for now. There are different sizes on these and it's 21 and 20 mil sockets for these bung plugs. Okay, well this 300 TDI engine at this age takes the two year blue antifreeze and summer coolant and corrosion inhibitor. It doesn't take red or OAT that will attack the metals in the radiator and the engine. So what I'm doing here basically is chucking in five liters and that will be through the expansion tank first. And then to fill up the radiator the rest of the way, you should be able to fill this up until it comes to the top of the bung plug and then you can cap it off. The strength is 50% antifreeze, 50% water mix. So that's 10 liters or possibly a little bit more. Once the fluid level has reached up to the top of the radiator bung, you can then fill up through the thermostat housing. Well, this thermostat housing bung plug bleed, if you like, is to fill up the cylinder head behind the thermostat. This stops getting airlocks in the cylinder head. Okay, so once it's up to level, you can then put your bung plug into place and tighten it up. Tighten this up and just nip it up. Don't crunch it up, otherwise you'll strip the threads. You see there, very light. The last thing what I'd advise to do is to check for any leaks. Now, what I have here is a pressure tester. The system is operating at 15 psi, which means when it's hot, there should be 15 psi of pressure constantly in the system. The radiator cap will release any excess. Now the idea is to pump this up to 15 psi and wait to see if it goes down. If it stays like that, then there's no leaks. The layman's way of doing it without any expensive equipment is to check for leaks visually. Get the engine hot, take it for a drive, run it about, and then check. You should have hard hoses and pressure in the system. All right, you can visually check for leaks, just mind out for rotating parts at the front of the engine, obviously. And a good way to find out whether your heater and the fluid is going around your heater matrix is check the heat on your heater pipes. And they should be warm, well, actually very quickly. Okay, well I'll stop you here. Just be careful when the system's hot, when you crack off the pressure cap, you could get scolded, so undo it very slowly. After then, what you can do when you let the pressure off is to check the level in the header tank. Now, it should be halfway up the header tank. Usually, you'll need to top it up again with a 50-50 mix, and you should be okay.